I'm an occupational therapist. Um, I can't believe that I've actually been qualified 30 years, um, which is quite scary because actually looking at some of your faces, you probably weren't even born when I qualified. Um, I used to work in social care. The only reason I went private was so I could work, um, uh, be, be around when my children were around, so I could go to sports days and pick them up and preferably not work only for summer holiday. Um, so I set up my own business and we we're a very small company, there's 21 OTs and we do work for commercial companies, we do work for individuals and a lot of work for um, catastrophic injuries due to accidents or injuries. So that's what we do. Like any good OT and parents, if you understand this, we have learning outcomes from what we're actually going to speak about. And so the, th the three key things for me today are have an overview as play as an occupation and I'll talk about what we mean by occupation. I'm hoping all the healthcare professions understand that uh, and if not I'll pick on you and say do you understand what it is. Um, be able to list the relevant legislation supporting bathing. Parents, legislation is your friend. Get to know it, love it and actually you can get a lot of things from social care if you understand the basis of where provision comes from. Um, and explain how, to clinical reasoning, how clinical reasoning can be used to support the necessity for bathing. I think it's there. Um, and again, it's about healthcare professionals not always saying no. You can have a shower, you don't have a bath. We need to look at all options. It doesn't mean to say bathing is the only option, but we need to look at it as part of the uh, assessment process. So, what is occupation? All the OTs should know what this is. is it, how many OTs have we got in here? Right. So, occupation, why we're called occupational therapists is because of occupation. An occupation is, refers to every day activities that people do as individuals, in families and within communities to occupy time and bring meaning and purpose to life. Um, and uh, this is really key. Occupations include things that people need to do, want to do and are expected to do. So would you say that people are expected to maintain their personal hygiene? Yeah? You'd like to think so, or else we wouldn't be sat so close to each other, would we? So it is an occupation, uh, and we need to think about that. So, is, it, is play an occupation? Yeah? But it's not? Does anybody think it's not? No? So play is an occupation, isn't it? Um, and if I said to you, um, What's the role of a child? What's the role of a child? What's their job? Learn, play, yeah. So to, to learn and to develop and, and to um, develop life skills, isn't it? And how do most of us learn? Play, this isn't it? Play, but it, it's not just confined to children either, is it? We might call it different words as we, as we get older, but if I do a leisure pursuit, that's me playing, isn't it? It's just a different form of word. So we need to understand that play is actually an occupation. So um, who has children? Yep, I do. Um, do you bathe your children? Or have you bathed your child? Yeah, some mine are a bit old to do it now, but you know I bathed my children when they were younger. When your children were younger, did you ever consider showering them, unless they were filthy coming home from a football match? No. So that's really interesting, isn't it? So out of this room of I don't know seventy or eighty people, people bathe their children and generally didn't shower their children unless it was the quickest way to do it. Right. So if I question you, 
as an occupational therapist or as a healthcare professional, why are we expecting parents to shower their children when we wouldn't necessarily expect them us to do it? It's just an interesting question, isn't it? And you could actually say it's because um, money, if we're honest, because it's cheaper, isn't it? But the legislation doesn't talk about money, does it? It talks about what's right for the individual. So if we park money, the other obvious thing is space, isn't it? You do realise that uh, England has the smallest bathrooms in Europe. What's the average size of a bathroom in the UK? Does anybody know? It's basically a bath length, which is 100... Do you do feet or inches? I'll do millimetres, there we go. It's 180 by 220. So English bathrooms are tiny. So often there's a space issue as well, isn't there? But is there anywhere in the legislation that says you can't extend? You might have a grants officer who says you can't extend. You might have a budget holder who says you can't extend. But, if bathing is the right thing for that individual, that's what we should be doing. So, we realise that bathing is an occupation. Do you realise there's a right to play? Has anybody seen this, uh, the UN Convention? Yay! Somebody seen it. This is one that not many people realise. Play is recognised as a fundamental human right a fundamental human right um, and it's part of the article 31 of the united nations convention for the rights of children the uk is signed up to this completely and utterly uh, and it states that a child has a right to leisure play and participation in cultural and artistic activities now, if we are not enabling a child to play, then we're not meeting this convention. And if we are using budgets as a way of stopping a child play, then are we meeting this Article 31? I would question, no, we're not. So we must remember that children have a fundamental human right to play. So why is play important? Because again, as, as, as therapists and as parents, we need to understand why play is important, don't we? So all those healthcare professionals should know all these. So independence. We learn how to be independent, don't we, through play. So you learn with your hands. You know, you learn hand dexterity. So in a bath, for example, you'd be learning to play with a sponge or filling something up. So you're developing hand function and hand function then leads to independence with maybe dressing or toileting hygiene and all those kind of things, eating. So play can lead to independence. And that's how we all learn, don't we? And, and, I mean, I don't know about you, but with my children, when I was teaching them to put things away, and, and you try and get that installed before they just don't do anything in the teenage years. But you do it through play, don't you? We used to sing to our children, and I won't sing to you, because you don't want to hear my toys. But we used to sing to our children about picking up the toys and putting them in a box. But it was play, because they learned through play. So independence is really key, but self-esteem and self-awareness, isn't it? So if I said to you, you can't bathe or shower for a week, honestly, who would be happy with that? We wouldn't, would we? Because actually being clean and being, um, well, not smelly to be basic, basic, is really important, isn't it? Because I know that if I sat down next to this lovely lady, and I didn't smell particularly ripe, 
you'd be struggling to stay put, wouldn't you? You'd probably pick up your things and move to the back of the room. And we don't want children or adults having to not um, smell. So, you know, self-esteem and bathing is really important. Um, but it also enables within play to teach children how to maintain their own personal hygiene, doesn't it? So you play with different sponges in the bath, don't you? Do you get your children to use the flannel to slap it on their face? It's fun to start with, but it's all teaching and developing a child's ability to look after their own personal hygiene. But it's play, so it's learning through play. Um, and respect for others. Uh, how many of you actually had a bath with a sibling? You bath with children together, don't you? And it's a great way of learning sharing. It doesn't always happen, but sharing. It's also um, about respect for others, about saying, well, you can have a bit of, you can play with this and then I'll play with this, or we can play together. So you're learning respect as well. It's all through play. And you can do that so well in the bath, can't you? Because you can have lots of toys in the bath and develop um, skills about respect for others. Um, but there's more, isn't there? It's, in a bath, when you play, you can explore risk-taking, can't you? Has anybody been in a bath when you hold your breath and you put your head under the water and you work out how long you can stay underneath it? That's risk, isn't it? It's learning risk. But it's also things like, um, and not all children with disabilities will be able to do this, but can you stand in a bath and learning risk? Because you know what's going to happen if you don't have a bath bath, don't you? You're going to go flying. But it's learning risk in a safe environment, and you can do that in a bath. Um, it's very difficult to do that in a shower, isn't it? It really is. Um, it's also about healthy lifestyles as well, isn't it? Um, I don't know about you, but some of the children that I work with, I use bathing as part of their routine for um, increasing range of movement, especially if you use it in the morning and you've got that bit of stiffness. We will often go through a routine of let's do the, all the range of movements in the bath. Now I can see all the occupational therapists go, that doesn't fit in with the legislation, does it? Um, because it's about facilitating access to a bath. But you need to read the legislation completely because it talks about facilitating access to and use of the bath. And us as therapists have to describe very clearly why we want to use that bath. And part of the occupation might be doing range of movements in a bath because it's better for the child. And it's just about explaining why you want that particular environment to support your child or your client. I just think about this evidence. To, to, to mums and dads or carers, um, often we have to go, where's the evidence to prove what we're doing? Um, do you have to look at evidence constantly? Are you a healthcare professional? What do you do? OT students. Oh, you're all OT students. OT students. Evidence, evidence, evidence. Where's the evidence? Right, so as an OT, we need to be able to evidence why we're doing something. And um, there is actually very little research in play in bathing, uh, but there is some. Um, and done in 2007, identified it bathing as a therapeutic medium for occupational therapists to use with children. She lists a number of ways bathing can be used as a sensory opportunity for children. And she proved it. And sensory, again, is one of those things that we don't often look at. So I'll give you an example of a child who is, say, hypersensitive to touch. And we put in a shower for this child. Has anybody had a shower when the, the water feels like it's actually kind of so forceful, it, it burns when it touches you? You know, those power showers that are really, really powerful. That's what a child with sensory issues feels when they're in a shower. And even if that shower is really light, 
So we need to know the sensory issues as well. And actually, you might find actually bathing is far more comfortable medium for them than a shower. Um, but also, within the bath, you can start to encourage different sensi uh, central, uh, sensory um, uh, feelings. So has anybody in their bath used shaving foam on the tiles for kids? Brilliant activity. So you spray shaving foam on the tiles and then you can get the kids to make a complete and utter mess. But then you can spray it off. You can make it even better by putting um, food dyes in it. So a couple of drops of food dyes. So you then have shaving foam with pinks and blues and greens. Can you do that in a shower? You can't. It's really difficult. Because what tends to happen when you're in a shower, you can have, it can happen in a bath, but in a shower, people tend to be put into a shower chair, which is very rigid and fixed, and doesn't allow you to um, move and do other occupations apart from personal hygiene. And personal hygiene that's usually done to you, not assisted with. So, Dunn was very keen on using bathing as a sensory environment, and not only as a activity, but also as a physical means to wash yourself. So, coming back to, is bathing an occupation? Bathing is an occupation. So as an occupational therapist, we should be looking at it, shouldn't we? So let's look at the boring bit, the legislation. So parents, I would suggest you just keep an eye on this because those students, OT students, and anybody else who's working with it, legislation is the way that you're going to be able to support your application for funding for a bath or any other adaptation I'd like to say. So let's start with the Children's Act. Uh, Schedule 2 outlines the range of services which can be provided and um, paragraph 6 in particular, the schedule requires authorities to minimise the effect on disabled children of their disabilities and give such children the opportunity to live uh, lives which are as normal as possible. So is bathing normal? Yes, isn't it? So why are we expecting children of five to shower? Would a child without a disability be showering? No. So why are we treating a child with a disability differently? Because we shouldn't, should we? So we need to start questioning why are we doing this? And I think for healthcare professionals, we need to go away with this thought in our head. Are we gatekeepers for our employers? Or are we advocates for our clients? Yeah? And those who are occupational therapists, I presume are registered with the HCPC. Yeah? Or will be. And where in the HCPC kind of ethics does it say that we have to look at money? I can tell you now, you won't find it. We have to think about resources, but fundamentally what's the most important thing and who is paramount is the children that we're working for. And we need to be able to clearly assess what their needs are. And if we're not doing that, we're not practicing as occupational therapists. Or we're not practicing as good healthcare professionals. The client has to be paramount and has to be at the centre of everything that we do. So, just going on to the Children's Act as well. Um, and there's a lovely lady here with her. Uh, daughter Izzy, and this is something I didn't actually mention to, to mum, which I should have done, but Children's Act Section 17 um, is a fund for children in need, um, and 
and a child who is disabled is perceived as a child in need. And Section 17 money provides for assistance for children in need, which includes disabled children, and this could include funding for essential equipment and adaptations. So you might want to go back to your social work and say, we have some cash from Section 17. Um, it's often seen as a, a kind of fund for social workers. It's not. It's a fund for all. And I think OTs need to say, we've got a shortfall here, can we have some money from Section 17? Um, I, and I'm a very passionate believer in, um, I don't understand the word no. Um, I think there's always a way around something. It might take a bit longer. It might take you to being a little bit more innovative in the way you do things. But no is not something that I want to hear you say to parents. It has to be yes, but let's see how we can do it. Um, unless, of course, there's a really good clinical reasoning for not doing it. And I have actually said to somebody, no, not now but let's revi revisit it in an early year or two years time. Children's Act as well, also section 11, places a duty on key persons and bodies to make arrangements, it's really boring, isn't it, when you start reading it like this, um, to ensure that in discharging the function, they have regard to the need uh, to the safeguard and promote the welfare of a child. Uh, so they should be, again, what you're saying, it's the welfare of the child, we must look at the child's individual needs um, and not kind of um, say no again. We must look at enabling rather than not enabling. So, and also I would say, you know, play is a right. Bathing is normal in the UK. So there has to be very good reason why we're dismissing bathing as an option. Um, I just want to mention here as well in the Children's Act is, is there anything in the Children's Act about other siblings? Does anybody, is anybody boring like me and read these acts? So some of them are okay to read, but some of them are pretty dire and dry. But the other thing in the Children's Act, it states that a sibling of a child with a disability should not be impacted by its siblings disability. So, say for example, you whip the bath out and put in a shower. Do you ever think about the other children in the house? Or mum? Or dad? Or the carer? Because actually you might be really impacting on their health and well-being as well. And we have a duty to take their needs into account as well. So the children, oh, Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act. Who was alive when this came out? 1970? Um, has this been repealed? It's been repealed for adults, hasn't it? It's been taken over by the, uh, the Care Act. But this is still in place for children. And it's the best bit of legislation out there. Um, so the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act requires social services to identify people with disabilities and to assess their needs and inform them of the services that they provide. So how clear are we of when we provide information about what grants are available or what funding is available? Do all social services or all your departments have very clear written guidelines about what you provide? I would say people don't. Uh, as I say, I've got 30 years of experience, and sometimes when I ring up social services, I struggle to get through to the right people. Now, if I struggle, and I know all the buzzwords, and I know the legislation, and I know what I'm doing, and I struggle, how do mum and dads cope? How do carers cope? You know, it's no wonder people are frazzled because they're constantly fighting a system which is not enabling them, but actually blocking them. So they need to inform them of the services. And we have a duty both as an OT to inform people of services. But section two is the clear one. 
which makes the provision of assistance for that person in arranging for carrying out any works of adaptations in their home or for the provision of any additional facilities designed to secure his greater safety, comfort and convenience. Now that's huge, isn't it? That is really huge. Those words can allow you to really um, look at what your client's needs are and provide for their safety, comfort and convenience. And certainly safety, anybody who's working with a child who has challenging behaviour and you need to look at something different, this is where you can look at it. Let's look at something different. And actually a child with challenging behaviour might better be washed in a bath rather than a shower. And we need to be able to do that. But it's also about convenience. Sometimes a bath for a particular child is easier for the whole family to manage than a shower is. Or the other way around. But are we assessing properly? Or are we dismissing bathing before we even get through somebody's front door? This is what I'm challenging you. Think about what we're doing. And, and not just think about the child, but the siblings and the mum and the dad. And are we providing for safety, comfort and convenience? Because that's what the legislation says. So if you've run out of money in the DFG, which is 30,000 at the moment, and all of us have got our fingers crossed that the grant is going to go up to... Anybody got a guess? I think it'll go up to about 45. Um, and at that, the review's coming out in, well, the end of this month, we've been promised. Uh, but at the moment it's 30,000. But if you've got up to 30,000, you can go back to social services and say, we need some money via this act to help us fund the most appropriate facilities for this child. So, Housing Grants and Regeneration Act. So this is a Disabled Facilities Grant. This is a 30,000 at present that's available to help you adapt um, your homes or your clients' homes um, to meet the, your children's needs. Uh, and it's a mandatory grant. And does, that, does anybody know what, I, what I'm saying when I say mandatory? It basically means that the local authority has a legal duty to provide a grant over and above all non-mandatory um, uh, activity that they're doing. So when people say to me, oh, we've run out of grant money, I go, no, you haven't. And they go, yes, we have. Our budget's been spent. And I go, well, I don't care about your budget, but you can't run out of money. It's a mandatory grant. You have to do it. So if you're providing libraries, swimming pools, you're providing flowers on um, roundabouts, if you are repairing pavements, none of that is a mandatory duty. This is. So you can't run out of money. I don't want to hear that word, because actually that's wrong. So, the, and also the, you know, the DFG now sits in with the Better Care Fund, and it's been taken away from the Housing Authority, in theory, although what seems to happen is it's automatically given back. But there's money in that pot. The problem is sometimes that money doesn't get down to the local authorities, and we need to challenge where that money is. It's a mandatory grant. They can't do anything else apart from education. They should be uh, meeting the needs of the grant. So there's 12 significant areas in the legislation and clearly defined. And actually, if you're going to read any legislation, this is the one to read. It's not that difficult to read. But don't read it before you go to bed at night or fall asleep at halfway through section 53. Um, so there's 12 and 6 areas and then there was an additional one added in uh, 2008, which was access to gardens. But don't even get me on to access to gardens because I'm going to talk about that for another two hours. Um, the key one I want to talk about is uh, Part L, which says facilitating access by the disabled occupant to or providing for the disabled occupant a room in which there is a bar or shower or both 
or facilitating the use of the disabled often of such a facility. Quite wordy, but the thing I want to stress here is you can have a bath, you can have a shower, or you can have both. And if we want to justify both, or we think it's appropriate to have both, then we can have both. But you've just got to be good at your clinical reasoning. What you find is most grants departments remove this bit, so you never see it. And that's why it's so important to understand your legislation. But the other thing for me is, is about the use of the bath. So you've got to be able to use it as well as access it. So for some people, a bath, say for example, with bubbles, that's using bubbles as a form of sensory um, uh, skills to enable a child to enjoy that bath. So if you've got a child who's blind, you might find the bubbles is that sensory input that they need. So again, don't dismiss what people call the luxury items. But sometimes those luxury items are just what you need for that child. It's about that holistic assessment of that person. So just talking about the Care Act, I'm just checking on time here because I don't want to go over. Um, I'm all right at the moment. Uh, as of April 2015, um, carers are entitled to an assessment where they appear to have a need. A carer is important. You know what, the amount of money our unpaid carers save the state is phenomenal. And yet, it wasn't until 2014 that they had any rights of their own. And again, it's mums and dads saying about their children, you know, I need a high-low bath because that enables me to get my child in and out easily. It enables me to be able to dry that child quite easily. It's going to be better for me, for uh, my health and well-being, you know, my, my moving and hungry, my musculoskeletal issues. You know, you just need to look at mums and how, well, just around the hall, how they're carrying their children. And I'm going, oh, 10 years time, they're going to have back problems. I want to prevent that now. I want them to be able to move their children safely now. Not in 10 years time, but now. So again, it's looking at the needs of the parents as well, and whether we're actually meeting those needs. So, coming back to OTs. OT students here, and the other OTs, getting our clinical reasoning in place. But I think it's also really important for mum and dads to understand what we're trying to think about here, and also other care professionals. You know, what do we mean by clinical reasoning? It's basically justifying what we're saying. That's what it is. Um, so we need to justify that we, the occupational performance. We need to understand that play is an occupation. We can clearly define that. That we need to get that play correct. We know that bathing can be a key area for play. And the right to play does develop life skills as discussed. So all those things we talked about before about developing social interaction, hand function, physical ability to wash, all of those can be used as part of the clinical reasoning. It's just defining it very clearly. So, you know, my daughter's called Connie. Connie needs to bathe because as part of that process of bathing, it enables her to have a, a better sleep hygiene. So I've used bathing, for example, for children where, that, where their sleep is not um, it's disrupted quite a lot and you have parents who come in with grey bags under their eyes because they're just not getting enough sleep and agitated because they're getting four hours and then a break and then two hours sleep and then maybe another two hours sleep. Well with this child we, who is kind of that pattern of sleeping 4-2-2, we worked out a different way of doing it. We put in a baked bath because we noticed when she went to respite and she had a bath, she slept better. It's, it's not rocket science, even I can work out that what's the difference between home and a respite was a bath. So we put in a bath for her and we produced this very clear ba uh, bathing routine or bedtime routine. So she'd come in, she would be bathed. While she was bathing, we had lights that dimmed. So lights dimmed, 
soft music started. Then we used to tumble dry bish out the towels. We get it out of the bath into warm, fluffy towels. We dry her off into a tumble dry PJs, which were also warm, into bed, and then slowly take down the lights and the noise, uh, uh, the lights and the music. And she went from sleeping at maximum four hours, and we're now up to eight and a half hours of sleep. Now, if I said to you, you could have four, four hours of sleep a night, or eight and a half hours of sleep a night, I think there's probably nobody here who'd want four hours of sleep. And you know what impact that had? Mum and Dad were suddenly able to function so much better because they were sleeping. They actually slept in the same bed for the first time in years because one was always sleeping with their daughter. And again, you know, just the impact of being able to sleep with your partner again was phenomenal. I won't go into the details they talked to me about, about sleeping together. Um, they were so excited. Um, and that had an impact on the child because her mum and dad weren't tired and they were doing more during the day. Because they were doing more during the day, she was tireder. So then she started sleeping better. And that was just a result. And yes, that bath might have cost £10,000. But the value of that bath was phenomenal. And what I said to social services is, let's put the bath in because if this child has to go into respite, we're talking at two and a half grand a week. So she only needs to go into respite five times a year and the bath's paid for. So the family don't have any respite now. And it saved the authorities thousands of pounds. And that's where we need to get our clinical reasoning right. Why are we doing what we're doing? Is there a reason for doing it? Work with your colleagues, work with respite, work with the school um, to find what's best for that child and ultimately best for the family. So there's the legal duties, of course, clinical reasoning. We have a duty to look after the children. Children are paramount. Um, OTs need to know that it's necessary and appropriate. And it's necessary and appropriate because it promotes play. It promotes social interaction. It helps with de development. All the things we discussed before can be part of the clinical reasoning. When you're in a bath, um, and I probably didn't go over this, is if you're in a shower chair and you're, you're kind of nicely strapped in and you're in a great postural position, um, it's quite difficult to teach personal care, isn't it? Because even if you've got a sponge or a flannel, you're restricted about places that you can get to. And if you're pushed back in a chair, it's really difficult to wash. Whereas in a bath, you have far much more freedom to learn how to uh, personal hygiene. And this is, to me, is the access to and use of under the housing grants. You can use that to say, well, we need also to allow this child to learn to do these skills themselves. And quite clearly, we should not be disadvantaging other children in the family. It's a legal duty. You know, we shouldn't be disadvantaging other siblings. And that's me. What I can say is, bathing isn't the only option. But my biggest fear is, as professionals, we are saying no to parents without really understanding why we're saying no. And we must remember that bathing and play go together and children have the right to play. And we must never forget we need to assess holistically and understand why we're doing what we're doing. Thank you. Any questions? Stand, what stand are we? C21. And I'll go down there as well. What reasons would you say no to a bath? What reasons would I say no to a bath? Um, generally, speed. So if, you, if you're having to get uh, uh, somebody up quickly, speed. Where you've got really complex postural needs. So, um, 
you can't always support a child perfectly in a bath, so it's what's best for them. Um, although I say nowadays with all the bespoke uh, positioning, you probably can. Um, you know, people sometimes say to me, epilepsy, rub it. You, know, you can bathe with epilepsy. I have no reason. You just have a risk assessment in place. Um, and if you use a bath like, like the Gemini bath, for example, you can pull the plug and raise somebody out. They can be out of it uh, very quickly. Um, so I think there's very few people who can't be bathed. Else. skin conditions, open pressure sores, you know, I mean, we even bathe children with trackies, you know, it's really good for kids with trackies, get some nice free flow movement. Anything else? Anyone else? You're very quiet. Um, I don't, it just really said that my boy has got a trackie. And through your talk, I just thought, oh, we we'll just completely stop laughing him because it's so difficult. He doesn't have any other problems, it's just his breathing disability. And it's become a battle and just listening to your talk. I thought, well, we haven't even got an OT involved, so I don't know how to go about getting one or more. So are you local to him? Chester. So, uh, Find out who you pay council tax to, bring the social service department, ask to speak to their paediatric OT team. I'm not sure what their waiting lists are, but say that you want an assessment to meet your child's needs. We, with trackies, we can work around trackies with um, special morning seating to keep them slightly up at uh, the, uh, the head end. Um, I've got somebody who's been bathing and she's now 21 and she's had tracking all the time. Um, but she loves it because it gives her free movement. She says, I spend most of my time fixed in, in a chair. She said, but actually it's quite nice to have that freedom to move around. So should I go back to my notes for my daughter's OT or my daughter's social work? I'd go back to the OT first. Question... We had a conversation earlier um, and just say, you. I always think, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy to be questioned about my clinical reasoning because if I can't justify it, I shouldn't be a therapist. Um, so I go back to the OT and say, can you tell me why you dismissed the bath? Um, that's the question first. Happy? The OT is just saying you won't get it. Okay, so... You won't get it. it um, is that clinical reasoning? You won't get it. That's like saying I won't win the rot lottery. You know what? Probably won't. But I could. But there's no reason for it. Why, why would you say that? You won't get it. Who, who's saying no? If they've assessed your daughter's needs specifically, and your needs, and siblings' needs, then actually, if the bath is better for Izzy, then the bath is better for Izzy. It's not about budgets or, or is there any grants officers in here? Or grants officers who tend to go no, 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 no. That's the only word they know. No. Um, but you, you question, you know, they shouldn't be making a clinical judgment. It's the OT. If the OT is saying no, I want to say, I want your clinical reasonings why you're saying no. And you can always email me. Any other questions? If you've got any questions, I'll go back to the stand because sometimes it's easier to ask them quietly, isn't it? Um, and, and just come and ask me. You know, you, you're very nice. Nobody's questioning me at all. You should like a good debate. Um, but do come and ask me. And thank you ever so much for coming.